Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hi, welcome back. Um, in this lecture, we're going to uh, extend the results of the previous lecture, and we're going to uh, discuss a very interesting problem, um, which is the transmission of a quantum particle through a potential barrier. Um, this is a purely quantum mechanical effect. Uh, it cannot be explained in any way, shape, or form by classical physics, and it's important for you to know that up front. Um, it also forms a, um, uh, uh, provides the basis for a large number of calculations that have, been, that have been performed over the past 50 or 60 years that describe results that are, uh, uh, that allow you to describe result, experimental results that are su extremely surprising. Uh, so I'd like to uh, go through this and explain the problem to you and try to convince you that uh, um, the results are somewhat surprising, and uh, uh, yet, yet uh, intuitively they're uh, they're uh, pretty straightforward if you uh, uh, if you understand quantum mechanics. So let's set up the problem. Okay, this is a little this 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 builds uh, a lot on the previous lecture. So if you were confused about the previous lecture, you have to go back and make sure that a lot of the concepts that we introduced in that lecture are uh, set well in your mind. Otherwise, you'll, 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 uh, you'll get baffled by this discussion. But the, the premise is um, a region in space now where there's a, a barrier, right? Uh, a finite width, we'll call the width of the barrier L, right? And the barrier is going to have some height V0 associated with it. And we're going to consider two cases. We're going to consider the case when a, a particle of mass m uh, is incident on this barrier from the moving from left to right. Uh, when the energy e of that particle is greater than v zero, and then the other case we'd like to consider is when the uh, energy of this particle is less than v zero. So the this this quantum particle is is striking this barrier at an energy that 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 places it below the, uh, the, uh, the height of the barrier. And we like to understand uh, uh, what fraction of the particles incident on the barrier actually uh, show up on the uh, uh, right-hand side of the barrier, actually get through the barrier. So classically, uh, what would you expect, right? Classically, you would expect that the particle would, would be traveling at some velocity. When it encounters this potential barrier, its velocity would slow down, right? And then it would reemerge on the other end and its velocity would pick up again, right? Because the, the distance, right? The dis, this distance here is precisely equal to this distance here. So there's no energy lost as the particle transmits over this, this step potential, right? It just slows down, right? And uh, classically, you would expect every particle uh, with an energy E greater than this quantity V0 would get through. So classically, you would expect all particles would have a unit transmission over this potential barrier. Classically, you would expect all particles with energy E less than V0 would be reflected from the barrier, right? That they would all, anything that comes in would be reflected back. And that's certainly the case if the, if the width of this barrier L is very large, right? We showed that in the previous uh, lecture. But what we're going to show is, surprisingly, that if this barrier has a finite width associated with it, that in fact there is a probability that the particles will tunnel through it. That's called quantum mechanical tunneling, uh, right? The the uh, the uh, electrons will, or the particle will quantum mechanically tunnel through this barrier, and emerge from the other end, right? And that is purely a quantum mechanical effect. Now, uh, to uh, to calculate the transmission and reflection probabilities, we need we're going to follow the same uh, prescription that we did in the previous lecture. We're going to insist that the wave function and the first derivative of the wave function be continuous at x equal to zero, uh, 
and we're going to insist that the derivative, uh, that the wave function and the first derivative of the wave function be continuous at x equal to l, right? These particles are represented by free particle wave functions, so that means they're going to have an e to the i k x type of uh, uh, argument, right? And just like in the previous lecture, we're going to have a particle moving from left to right. It's going to have a wave function represented by a e to the i k one x. The the uh, uh, particle that's reflected from this barrier traveling from uh, right to left is going to have a wave function b e to the minus i k one x. Right. The uh, particle that's transmitted is also going to have um, a wave function given by a free particle state. It's going to have the same k vector as we had over here. Right. The reason the k vector is going to be the same is because there's no energy lost as the particle transmits through this barrier or, or passes over the top of it. Right, so the, the total energy of the particle is conserved in this. There's no energy loss mechanism. The tricky part here is recognizing what the form of the wave function is in region two, right? And that depends on whether E is greater than V0 or E is less than V0. If E is greater than V0, then we have free particle wave functions because the, uh, the potential is constant. It's constant at this value, V0. So in principle, the wave function in this region of space can be represented by uh, uh, two, uh, two contributions. One contribution is a particle moving from left to right. A second contribution is a particle moving from right to left. This second contribution is due to, to scattering of electrons from this abrupt change in the potential here at x equal to L. Right? For the region where E is less than V0, right, the, uh, the free particle wave function will no longer apply because the, uh, uh, the particle is classically forbidden from this region in space. And that just simply means that the wave function in this region here has to be represented by exponentially uh, uh, dependent uh, factors, e to, the, e to the cap x and e to the minus cap x, right, with coefficients c and d. And the trick, of course, is going to be uh, the same that we used in the previous uh, example. It's, it's not a trick. It's just, you know, we have to, we have to figure out what a, b, what C and D and what this constant E is in order to make these boundary conditions true. All right, so that's, that's the issue. It's important for you to understand uh, how these wave vectors K1, uh, K2, right, up here, kappa, how those wave vectors are, de are defined. And I try to clarify that in this slide here where I, I, I write down the definition of the wave vectors for all uh, regions of space, right? And uh, it's important for you to understand these definitions and how we got them, because if you don't understand how to write these wave vectors down, uh, then um, you probably don't understand why these are the wave functions uh, for the three regions of space. So that's... Uh, that's something that you're going to have to work through on your own and, and convince yourself that, that you understand those definitions. This, uh, the uh, calculation of the transmission probability for an electron over that barrier is uh, straightforward, but it, it really requires some serious algebra. And um, I'm not going to go through it. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's actually overwhelming. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of ways you can make mistakes, uh, but the, um, the final results are important, okay? Final results are that if the energy E is greater than V0, then we have a transmission probability that's related to the, the magnitude of E squared divided by the magnitude of A squared. So remember, this is the par these are the particles that are incident on the barrier. E represents the particles that are transmitted over the top of the barrier. And this transmission probability has this form here, which only involves um, the energy uh, of the electron, uh, or the energy of the particle, the height of that potential barrier, V0, and the uh, wave vector, K, 
of the particle when it's in the barrier region, when it's in region two of that, that, that uh, position in space. Uh, so this is interesting because the sine squared will oscillate as K2 over L uh, varies. So K2 depends on the energy, and as we increase the energy, this argument will uh, go through uh, integer multiples of 2 pi, and it will cause an oscillation in the transmission probability that the particle uh, passes over the barrier. Uh, when the energy of the incident particle is below the height of this barrier, this is the case E, E less than V0, uh, we have to use the, uh, the exponentially decreasing form of the wave function in region 2. Uh, the transmission probability is again given by this quantity E squared over A squared, and in this case, we find uh, exponentially uh, damp transmission probability. It's, it, it actually involves this hyperbolic sine squared. And this parameter kappa is now defined in terms of the difference between V0 and E. So now V0 is, is greater than E, so this square root term is, is positive. Um, this, this expression here is very often uh, written in terms of uh, is, is often simplified by expanding this uh, hyperbolic sinh squared. And what you can show is if you expand hyperbolic sinh squared in the limit when kappa L is a, is a small value, right, uh, then the transmission probability simplifies to a very simple form, which is 16 E over V0 times this quantity 1 minus E over V0 times this exponentially damped factor e to the minus 2 kappa L, right? So this is the expression that you find in many, many, many textbooks. It's a, an approximation to this particular uh, equation. And I'll show you in the next slide that, that for all intents and purposes, this much simpler form for the transmission uh, matches very well with this exact, uh, exact equation written above. So to, uh, to demonstrate the important points of this, these results, and, and really all we can do in this, in this uh, class is, is try to get you to appreciate how to use these equations and how to appreciate what the equations are telling you. Uh, so to do that, I, I just worked out a calculation of T and R, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of, of the transmission probability T, is, is a function of energy E for a particle of mass uh, equal to the electron mass incident on a potential barrier that's two nanometers wide and the potential barrier has a height of five electron volts. And what I do is I plot uh, the transmission probability and notice that the transmission probability is divided into two regimes. Uh, when the energy E varies from 0 to 5 EV, then I'm in the regime where uh, the incident energy is always less uh, than the height of the barrier. And in that regime, the probability that the electron tunnels through the barrier depends exponentially on the width of the barrier and this, this, uh, this coefficient kappa. The second regime is, is when the energy is above the height of the barrier, so when E is greater than V0. When E is greater than V0, right, we're going to expect an oscillatory behavior in the transmission probability, and that's, of course, exactly what you see. If you, if you look carefully here, you can see oscillations in the transmission. These oscillations I blow up and I show in, in greater detail uh, over here, so you can, you can see that that the, the probability that the electron passes over the barrier actually oscillates up and down as a function of energy E. So uh, it's important to recognize that this expression for the, this approximate expression for the transmission probability, I've indicated by red dots. Those red dots basically lie right on top of the calculated, exactly calculated um, uh, value for transmission that I get when I use this, this more complicated form. So this approximation here is in fact pretty darn good uh, over uh, most energies uh, 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 for the uh, uh, 
the incident particle. The other thing, the other thing to appreciate from this plot, this is an amazing plot because, right, the transmission probability varies from a number like 10 to the minus 20 all the way up to unity, which is up here. Ten, uh, this is a log scale, right? So this is, everything's compressed. So there's a huge variation in the transmission probability. This variation is, is very nearly linear, right? It's very nearly, nearly linear with energy. And of course, that's what this equation is saying here. On a log scale, if, if everything's dominated by the exponential, you just get a, uh, basically a straight line. And, and until you get very close to the top of the barrier, right, the, the tunneling probability varies exponentially uh, with position uh, or with, with energy E. So a uh, few things that are of interest here, right? Again, just to recap, the transmission probability uh, when energies E are less than the barrier, those transmission probabilities vary over uh, many, many orders of magnitude. They essentially go from zero all the way up to unity when the when the when the particle is 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 uh, energy is is equal to the height of the potential barrier. When the particle goes over the uh, the top of the potential barrier, you pick up this oscillatory behavior, which again is a quantum mechanical effect, and it basically says that the transmission of a particle over that barrier will oscillate uh, with the energy of, of, of that, that particle. Uh, I also uh, do some other calculations to, uh, to reinforce these results. Uh, and these calculations I consider different widths of the barrier. So I I look at barriers that are one nanometer, one and a half nanometers, two nanometers wide, and I uh, plot transmission probability as a function of incident energy. So again, here I got a, I got a potential barrier of 5.5 EV. This is the energy E of the electrons. And you can see that if you just decrease the width of the barrier by a factor of two, if you go from, uh, from, one, from two nanometers to one nanometer, right? and you have a constant energy E striking a barrier, right? Uh, the transmission probability increases by about 12 orders of magnitude for a factor of two change in the width of the barrier. So uh, how much of the particle gets through depends very sensitively uh, not only on its energy, but on how wide that barrier is. And if you can shrink that barrier uh, down to, to values on the order of uh, a few tenths of a nanometer, then the transmission probability is very high. On the other hand, if the width of that barrier is on the order of uh, a few nanometers, the transmission probability is extremely low. It's very, very small. So um, uh, you can plot the wave functions uh, uh, of the particle in the different regions. So here's region one, here's region two, here's region three. The important thing to realize from this plot is that in regions one and three, the wave function oscillates pretty much as you would expect for a free particle. In region two, the wave function is exponentially decreasing, right, as, as you would expect because the probability that a classical particle in this regime is zero, right? So uh, the, uh, the square of the wave function tells you what the probability is, of course, that you're going to find a particle of different regions of this, uh, of this problem. And, uh, you, you need this exponentially decreasing wave function in the barrier, uh, region in order to, uh, 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 reflect that fact. So I give a couple of examples here, uh, uh, just to, um, uh, bring home the point. Um, I, I consider the effect of a very thin oxide layer on current flow. So the idea is I take two wires, I twist the two wires together, right? And if, uh, if in, in the region where the two wires touch, right, they're actually separated by a very thin oxide layer, then what's going to happen is there's going to be a, a high resistance for current flow through that oxide barrier, and, and it's actually going to heat up, right? It'll, it'll get very warm there. And you can actually model that in terms of uh, tunneling through a, 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 a potential barrier, right? So if you know the oxide thickness, in this case, I just guessed an oxide thickness of five nanometers, uh, 
then that five nanometer oxide is going to represent the width of this particular barrier, right? You're going to have to tell, uh, tell me what energy the electrons strike this potential barrier. I, I assume they're, they're coming in with an energy of about seven electron volts. And I want to calculate what the probability is that the electrons go from the gold wire to the blue wire, which would represent electrons which actually tunnel through this barrier and escape, uh, escape over here to region three. So I, uh, I work all that out uh, uh, on this slide. Uh, again, uh, you have to be able to calculate this, uh, this wave vector kappa, this parameter kappa. That requires you to know the, the uh, energy and the height of the barrier, right? M is the mass of the electron, so you got to put that in. You have to remember to convert electron volts to joules by multiplying by the charge on an electron. Again, you get an expression for kappa. This is the wave vector of the electron in region two. You, once you have this expression for kappa, then that allows you to evaluate the transmission probability. And what you find is that basically the transmission probability in this case is essentially zero. It's something like 10 to the minus 38, which simply means that no current is going to flow, right? If, if you've got a five nanometer thick uh, oxide layer, uh, between two conducting wires, the current through that oxide layer is essentially going to be zero. Uh, I also do a second example where I consider current flow in a semiconductor device. So this is a, a, a simple model where I, uh, I accelerate electrons in a semiconductor, give them two electron volts worth of energy. I try to pass those electrons into a drain or into a, an electrode which goes to ground. Uh, separating the semiconductor from the electrode is a thin oxide layer, right? And we're going to say that this oxide layer has got a width of about one nanometer. We're going to say that the height of that barrier that, 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 that uh, is presented to electron flow, we're saying that's about seven electron volts, right? And then this um, uh, slide, I go through the calculation of the transmission probability. Here, the transmission probability is not zero. It's about 10 to the minus 10, 3.8 times 10 to the minus 10. And so that simply means that if I've got a nanoamp of current flowing in the semiconductor, well, a nanoamp of current is about six times 10 to the ninth electrons per second. The implication is that the current that passes through that oxide layer is the transmission probability about 3.8 times 10 to the minus 10 times this current flow of 6.25 times 10 to the ninth. So I'm going to get about 2.4, 2.5 electrons per second passing through that barrier. So it's going to be a very effective uh, at stopping current flow. And uh, just an example of, of how you might use this, this result to uh, to estimate current flow in, in a number of different situations. And I'll end the lecture by saying that um, the algebra involved in these calculations is, is uh, uh, formidable. And uh, as a result, uh, there are many uh, uh, web-based simulations of these uh, transmission probabilities through potentials, through potential barriers of finite width. Uh, I give you a a website here if anyone's uh, interested in, in running these simulations. Simulations are very straightforward. They don't cost any money, uh, but they allow you to adjust the width of the barrier, the height of the barrier. You can adjust the energy, uh, the electron energy E with respect to the barrier height. And then uh, these calculations allow you to estimate transmission probabilities and allow you to visualize uh, wave functions in different regions of space. So if you're interested, please take a look at that. And um, uh, it's, I think it's worth the time. You learn a lot by just doing uh, these simulations. Uh, so thanks for listening to this. These last two lectures are, are really important because they, um, they, they cover a result that quantum, quantum mechanics predicts. Uh, completely different than classical physics. And of course, I wouldn't be up here talking about these things if experiments over the past hundred years or so haven't verified the, uh, 
the details of these uh, theoretical uh, expectations. So think about it. It's kind of interesting, and it's uh, it's really different than than you would uh, expect based on your understanding of classical physics.